So, no one told you life was gonna be this way. In today's video that you're watching on the YouTubes, we're gonna be talking about that staple of straight, cisgender, white culture that dominated the 90s and really embedded itself in the zeitgeist of popular culture, Friends. Now, as might be obvious from the title, this isn't a deep dive on everything in Friends, because I don't want to do that to either myself or to you. And I honestly think it would be rather boring, because in a lot of the episodes, nothing of interest really happens. A spicy take that I assume will annoy at least one person who made Friends their whole identity, and honestly, a go-off queen in the comments. For the rest of us, I just want to hone in on the single thing that interests me specifically about a show that my family religiously watched multiple times over and over and that undeniably had some kind of formative impact on myself as a child. The representation of queerness and queer people within the plot lines and characterizations of this dominant defining titan of television. And more specifically, I want to talk about a single character, that of Charles Bing or Helena Handbasket, because I have a lot of confused opinions and ideas that are formed around how this was particularly written and presented to us. Now, one of the clearest things that will stand out to a lot of people, especially if you right now go and do a rewatch of the show, is the way in which there are clearly some gay people in it. We have a very openly lesbian couple that even gets married, and whose existence is a catalyst for a large part of the friend's motivations. Specifically that whole Ross and Rachel thing that I could not have cared less about. Fuck Ross to have been an absolute piece of shit dullard. I'm sorry, but there's, there's a lot of Ross hatred in me that has never had a chance to come out. And this lesbian couple is Carol Willock and Susan Brunch, whose relationship is admittedly the butt of a few jokes, and whose orientation is quite often either mocked or taken lightly by these specifically cis-straight characters that are our protagonists. Hey, Daddy! <laughs> How come you don't live with Mommy? <laughs> How come Mommy lives with that other lady? <laughs> A lesbian. <laughs> but it cannot be denied for its persistent portrayal from their perspective as being consistently loving and who they are openly. While Friends might play very fast and loose with how respectful it is and how respectful its characters are in the comedy that it makes around their lesbian status, which is almost seen as this obscure, mystical thing that none of them can really 100% understand from the outside, or get, at the very least, they do end up having their happy ending, and they're allowed to exist as themselves in a way that is never infringed upon in a narrative sense. Look, do you love her? And you don't have to be too emphatic about this. <laughs> of course I do. Well, then that's it. And if George and Adelaide can't accept that, then the hell with them. Never breaking them up so they can go back to the straits, or have any other stereotypical drama bullshit that another show might try and shove in so that the gays don't get to have a happy time. It is far from perfect, but it matches and sometimes surpasses a consistent imperfection that existed within other shows and their gay characters at that time. Carol and Susan's relationship is the first real connection within Friends that we get with an idea of queerness, and it's honestly far from terrible or confusing or poorly interpreted, which might come as a surprise to some people that thought Friends was just all bad. The same, however, cannot be said for the other queerness of Charles Bing. And I know that a few of you probably want me to talk about that episode where Joey and Chandler pretend that the baby is theirs so they can attract women only to find out that it makes people think they're a gay couple and they freak out about it, but what more can one say except the joke is that straight people, especially men, hate it when people assume they are gay because it makes them feel as if they are feminine and femininity is regarded as wrong or an offence to your manly identity in a patriarchal society. You know... 
My brother and his boyfriend have been trying to adopt for three years. What agency did you two go through? <laughs> That's a good plan, Joe. Next time we want to pick up women, we should just go to the park and make out. No. While there isn't much more to say about that kind of stuff, Chandler's reaction to that homosexuality, or the interpretation of his own gender identity, is something that we do get alluded to a few times in the show as being fraught by his own relation to his father. There is a lot of stuff tied up in there from Chandler's perspective about how his dad was sleeping with the same pool boy that his mother was, that his father turned up to various events dressed in full and open drag, sleeping with various figures in his life such as teachers, and that they are not in contact much anymore, specifically and clearly due to an intense amount of shame from Chandler towards who his father is and the way that his father acting like he did and existing like he did called into question a lot of Chandler's masculinity and own identity, especially as it led to mocking from others towards him for his father's actions. There's a lot of blame and difficulty between this straight cis child and their parent who is, in the show, some kind of queer. What is the name of Chandler's father's Las Vegas all-male burlesque? Viva Las Vegas! <laughs> Unfortunately, that is correct. Yes! <laughs> that some kind of queer element is something that I want to get into after we talk about the two essential episodes to discuss, the two episodes that actually feature Chandler's father, and let us see Charles Bing for more than just what their son sees of them from a distance. The first episode to talk about is the one with Chandler's dad, which is midway through the build-up to the wedding between Chandler and Monica, where Monica is pushing Chandler to reconnect with his father so that they can come to the wedding. And it leads to them going on a trip to Las Vegas to talk to them in person. Our first true introduction as an audience to Charles Bing is when they appear as Helena Handbasket and perform on a stage and in a crowd in a rather classical drag performance. Now, there are four takeaways from this scene immediately that are essential for us to lock away in the old brain matter. The first is that Chandler is obviously uncomfortable around drag queens, while Monica is more uncertainly just doing her best to get the lingo right. Has someone taken her order yet? Uh, oh yeah, uh, she did. Uh, he did. She? Uh, I'm sorry, I'm new. I don't... <laughs> Yeah, I just ordered a beer. They're straight, I get it. <laughs> this is honestly quite replicative of a lot of straight cis people's attitude towards engaging with queer culture. And I think it really does a good job in showing the way that Friends undeniably had gay influences on its writing team. Including the big one of, you know, a gay man helped to co-create the show. So it led to them being able to sort of appropriately showcase the way that I assume their cis straight friends reacted to them, either with this horrifying desire to not want to be involved in it or try to push themselves into masculinity with Chandler's ordering of a beer and making it very clear to the drag queen waitress that it's just getting a beer and Monica's more jovial not quite getting it. The second thing to note is the way that the laugh track is utilised in this scene, specifically around Chandler's bitter and aggressive comments towards his father. It seems as if we as an audience are meant to be laughing at the pain that Chandler feels because of the shame of who his father is. A shame that clearly doesn't affect Charles themselves and absolutely does not impinge upon their ability to act as they are. But this idea of them being not necessarily the direct butt of the joke, but the effect butt of the joke, is something that the narrative does carry over in a lot of the scenes involving Charles. They and their identity and how they act is a joke to a lot of people slash the laugh track, and they are the centre of a lot of comedy by virtue of who they are. Something that does really exemplify that straight cisgender audience that the Friends show is trying to appeal to, and was working into even when it incorporated queerness into its narratives. Even the queer jokes that are made by Charles are, while admittedly 
pretty funny. I do indeed like the one about not being a fan of New York, but being a fan of Queens. It's a classic, but those are very basic jokes that are designed to land with that cis straight audience. It's something that utilizes a lingo that they can all get. The queerness existed in a way that was either easily laughed off or made fun of so that it would not raise too many uncomfortable questions for the watchers. All that is tied into a lot of history around queer representation in media, that it was oftentimes only allowed to be shown if it was made clear that the queer people were either villains, that their lifestyle would punish them in some way, that they suffered for being queer, or that they were comedic elements that were not to be taken seriously a legacy that has haunted many representations of us for decades and to this day does affect how critically the community does view attempts to put us into movies or TV shows. I'm sure we can all think about the bury your gaze trope that, to this day, people are still doing. Not directly looking at Supernatural, just sort of, you know, vaguely hinting in that direction. The third thing to take away in this is the person who plays Charles Bing. Namely, the actress Kathleen Turner, who was admittedly renowned in their day for playing sexually charged roles and being very attractive. Now, this is truly the start of the question raising for me explicitly, because it begins to form a really confused perspective that is never really confirmed on what exactly is Charles being meant to be something that is heavily mixed up in the terminology used around them and how they engage with the world. In this exact same Las Vegas scene, there are drag queens acting as waitresses who are explicitly men in drag, which is what a lot of drag queens are. There are, of course, drag queens that are trans men, that are trans women, but for most cis audiences, especially at this time, a drag queen was a gay man who dressed in women's clothing. So it seems interesting that they chose to go with this actual actress to be Chandler's gay drag performing dad, unless you consider other scenes and the implications that this might in fact be closer to the Hollywood trope of having cis women play trans women. And that a trans woman can also perform in drag shows if she wants, as we covered earlier. The other episode that we want to talk about here really does emphasize this idea more and gives us a little bit more to sink our teeth into with this, but I want to plant that seed for you to mull over now. That idea that the identity of Chandler's dad is not, while presented to us as a gay man performing drag, might in fact actually be a trans woman that's just been poorly interpreted through writers that didn't quite get it and into a cis audience that also just didn't get it. Our final piece from this scene is where it goes, which is this rather heartfelt and laughter devoid interaction between Chandler and his father, with it being clear that Charles has been kept out of the loop on most of their son's life, and we can really see the hurt felt by the fact that they are just finding out about the engagement slash wedding so late with no direct invitation to it. Actually, Monica and I are engaged. Really? Congratulations. When's the big day? In, in two weeks. I see. Well, I wish you both a lifetime of happiness. So, you're bald. This is honestly kind of beautiful stuff. An incredible performance by Kathleen Turner as well, in that we connect immediately with the loss that the character of Charles Bing is feeling from making the decisions that they did with their sexuality and identity, and how that made them push away and leave their family to the degree that it left all sides distant and unable to communicate. Chandler is also in this scene making the step to try and broach this, to formally invite his father, by making it clear that regardless of everything that might have happened, that he does want his father to be there, even calling his father ma'am. An attempt to bridge that gap between their very distant communities in concepts of self and family and masculinity. Admittedly, after this scene, which kudos to the actors involved, incredible, it does go right back to almost naked men dancing to its reigning men, because the queer stereotypes have to exist, or we would remember that these are the gays. But that moment in this scene is something unique. 
something that many other sitcom shows did not have around the trans slash queer characters they used, if they used trans characters at all. I bring this bit up because I do want people to understand that for all Friends' failings, and for all its appeals to the dominant cultural audience that it was designed for, it did break some ground with how it came across to them. Much in the same way that Carol and Susan were different in some format to a lot of queer representation that was expected on mainstream media, being a lesbian couple that managed to survive an entire show and do well, Charles Bing in this scene is a step in the right direction for trans people on TV. A step in the right direction that even later shows like How I Met Your Mother failed to build on and even achieve. Instead, choosing to focus on that mocking of queerness and trans identities as sex workers or secretly men trying to gay the straight to the deceptions, which I am sure that somebody has already talked about in depth. Oh wait, look, it was me on this channel that you can go and watch right now if you haven't already. But on to the next episode, which features Charles Bing. That of the wedding itself, called the one with the wedding. Because, look, being creative with titles is for those artsy types. Friends never played ball with that bullshit. It was always a pretty easy, clear message of how they labelled their episodes. In the one with the wedding, we get to see Charles Bing interact with the other parents, especially with Nora Tyler Bing, i.e. Chandler's mother. It is very clear from the interaction that they have that there is no love lost there between them and that Chandler's family difficulty can very much more likely be blamed on the hostility from both sides of the parentage than towards any queer elements that might have affected Chandler himself. He took it as that being the issue, but in reality, this was just a bad family dynamic. We also get to enjoy watching the Geller parents struggle so hard to be good allies by having no freaking clue what to say towards queer people, and not even being sure which parent was the queer slash trans drag queen trans woman... something. The Gellers are actually another perfect encapsulation of cis-straight attitudes from the time period towards trans identity, being overtly invasive in the interest of establishing their own moral slash ethical standing of hashtag allies. So, are you his mother or his father? Chuck. What? I've never seen one before. Dad, there's Ross. Why don't you go talk to him? Oh. I didn't even have a chance to act as though I'm okay with it. I would also be loath to not mention the way that Charles Bing absolutely reads the shit out of Nora, and Nora only has the comeback of going straight to some turf transphobe biology penis shit. So, and look, I ain't biased here, but we know who won that one. Yes. Although I think we may be seeing a little too much of some people. <laughs> Aren't you a little old to be wearing a dress like that? Don't you have a little too much penis to be wearing a dress like that? <laughs> and the same thing exists throughout these few scenes and lines involving Charles, in that I don't really understand where the joke and the laugh track is meant to be pointing us. If anything, it seems to be more utilised to downplay the severity of the offensiveness by which the other characters interact with Charles, playing after a character say something that would absolutely be considered in all other contexts as completely not okay to say to somebody. The other continuing element into this episode is that we see Charles removed from the drag performance as Helena Handbasket, and we see that they are still presenting as a woman that they are dressed and act and identify in ways that are feminine and womanly, which goes beyond an interpretation of a gay man who is doing drag and crosses over into that whole trans woman living as a woman in all regards, but who is not acknowledged as such, and the terminology for it is not introduced or properly expounded upon, that, you know, does seem to be a big issue. It is annoying because it leaves such an open question mark as to who they are supposed to be. And while an open question mark is a perfectly valid gender identity and slash or sexuality, in a case such as this, within a show that is so cis and straight even when it's queer, it comes off as being more a poor interpretation of transgender identity into the existing framework of gay men and drag culture that other shows like South Park also played around with in the future to equally confusing and honestly quite off-putting degrees that it is an issue but I paid $5,000 to be a woman.
This would mean I'm not really a woman. It's, I'm just a... I'm just a guy with a mutilated penis. Basically, yes. Oh boy, do I feel like a jackass. This brings us, with all this evidence and elements, to the big point that I need to get across here. And I know a few of you are already very aware of the massive crane-shaped elephant in the room, but I promise we're going to talk about them, and we kind of already had, and that is, who exactly is Charles Bing slash Helena Handbasket? Are they a gay man who performs drag and has been confusingly mixed up with elements of transgender culture and identity, or are they a trans woman who performs drag and whose associations with gay culture has been used to erase that part of them in favour of just lumping queerness together under a single label? And here's the thing. While for a long time, and from a lot of people that I've talked with, none of us had any freaking clue which it was meant to be, it was cleared up eventually in 2022 in an interview with The Conversation where Marta Kaufman, one of the co-creators of Friends, made it clear that the character of Charles Bing was supposed to be a trans woman, but that in creating it, her and David Crane, the other co-creator of Friends that I mentioned beforehand, the openly gay man whose influence can be argued to have directly led to Friends at least incorporating elements of gay culture into its run, even if as a gay man he was unable to stop the show from misrepresenting and screwing over the trans community in how they wrote Charles Bing explicitly. In this, we kind of hit the Dumbledore issue. Where a character is confirmed to be something years after they were created and after they entered the cultural consciousness, and far too late for the damage to have already been done to whatever they were representing. The way in which Charles Bing, who I consistently have called Charles Bing because we have no updated name for them except for their drag queen name, and they openly use Charles Bing within the show, which is, that's why I've stuck to it because I, I've got nothing else is presented as a mixed-up version of queerness and transness, has already impacted cis-straight visions of trans people and our place in queer culture, such how we are to be treated, because it was done decades ago. It is far too late 20 years later to really clean all this up, and this is an issue because media representation does really matter, especially for minorities when a lot of the ways in which the dominant cultures are going to really interact with or engage with a minority, especially in those days before the big trans wave of 2016 and when trans models, actors, activists, politicians and otherwise really broke into the mainstream perceptions. Because for many cis straight people, the only trans people that they are ever going to really get a chance to have an impression from were those that they saw on the screen. Shows like Friends, much like shows like How About Your Mother, contribute to the attitudes that many people form and cling onto, that they take into their lives, and that they end up using towards real people who can be harmed by it. It can also hurt those who are in the closet or might be questioning, and see such difficult and obscure representations as Charles Bing that don't really match with their sense of self or how they view their own identity, because it isn't really written to appropriately reflect trans people and trans culture. And this brings us to another big point that always comes up from these shows in the past. A point that, you, you know, like, it really focuses on its place in the past. Arguing that it's silly or ridiculous to go back and consider it in the context of modern sensibilities towards offensive language or narrative, or that it's a product of its time period and reflected outdated attitudes and information. I dislike those ideas, and those arguments, for a few reasons. Firstly, we should feel comfortable going back and critiquing the stuff that was formative towards popular culture, that had a large impact on a lot of people, because only through doing that can we understand what sort of effect it might have had on where we are right now, and it helps people be more introspective about the media consumption that they've engaged with. Something that I think everybody should always be trying to do. Secondly, the stuff in those older shows was still offensive at the time. It was just the people in charge and the groups it was appealing to either found that offensive stuff funny or were encouraged to find it funny by the placement of laugh tracks and the existential dread of institutionalized bigotry that pervaded the landscape of film and TV. They were always homophobic, transphobic, racist, sexist, it was just that at the time, the people who found that offensive did not have much of a voice or were not cared about. 
Finally, this idea that they could not have been better because of when they were made. This is an idea that is not even backed by the creators in the case of Friends, as in the interview that we previously mentioned, both Kathleen Turner and Martha Kaufman stated how they wished things had been done differently, and that mistakes were made in the process that they could have and should have rectified. There were plenty of previous movies and TV shows and real-life situations that featured far more clear and concise representations of trans women, going all the way back to stuff like Adam Est Eve, Christine Jorgensen, I Want What I Want, The World According to Garp, all of which existed decades before Friends did, and therefore the idea that they couldn't do better because it was in the 90s is a false one. They could have done better with the representation, they just didn't. So, here we are, at a conclusion. And I find that on YouTube people really like it when you're clearly opposed to something. People love it when you hate on a piece of culture, when you encourage their dislike towards it. And while I would love to tell you that Queerness and Friends was merely just bad, and that the entire show is bad and irredeemable, and we can all have a good laugh at it for sucking, I don't feel or agree with that so strongly. I mean, Friends does have so many more issues. Like, what's the deal with all the white people? And what's the deal with Phoebe locking her boyfriend away somewhere? Or what's the deal with how they managed to get that rent-controlled apartment? Or what's the deal of how they all managed to find time to just not do work and hang out in a cafe? But yet again, this isn't a deep dive on the entirety of the show, this is just about Charles Bing. And focusing on just Charles Bing, it's a mixed bag. While it is undeniable that the mistake was made, and they screwed up the inclusion of a trans character into the narrative, a screw up that negatively and adversely portrays transness in terms that are not accurate to who we are, and in fact confuses us more with other pieces of the queer community, a confusion that cis straight people would not be able to see for the mistake that it was, and therefore would be stuck taking Charles Bing and who they are at face value, and applying that to other trans people that they meet or that they interact with, there are still moments that do echo sentiments that can speak to our community. The moment between Charles and Chandler when Charles is invited to the wedding is, as I mentioned before, beautiful. It's a hopeful vision of getting over bigotry and shame at a time when it really matters, and admitting that you want your parent to be in your life, even if decades of mentally caging yourself behind a prison of toxic masculinity makes it nigh impossible to really interact with your trans parent without feeling deeply embarrassed about yourself. The way in which Charles Bing holds themselves to is something that is not accepting of the shame that others place onto them, is a sense of pride and place that does allow them to still be a character that while I might feel was disserviced by the narrative and disserviced by the writers failing to engage with trans terminology and identity, is one that I would still be happy claiming as an icon in retrospective and in defiance of the overwhelming cis-straightness of Friends as a cultural monolith. We get to choose and sort of define our own icons, and we can carve them out from the places that they were not fully appreciated in, because that's what we do anyways. And so, rather than dismiss Charles Bing as a product of a bad show and bad writing, I think maybe we should steal them instead, and bolster who they are as something that we can be proud of of representing an idea of transness in a very hostile cis environment 30 years ago. She, and I know I have used gender neutral pronouns so far, specifically because of the confusing nature slash interpretations of Charles Bing, but she is a strong, independent trans woman who didn't let any of the haters or the cis allies put her down, who lived as she was even when the show she was on didn't know how to appreciate her or properly address her. That is kind of a trans thing. So why don't we truly take her back, now when we have decades of detachment, to do so in a way that lets us get her away from the other atrocious wave of shitty things in the friend show? Anyway. 
that's my opinion on the character of Charles Bing and my analysis of their appearance in Friends and how it interacts with my analysis of Friends presenting queerness. And hopefully you learned something or it triggered some encouragement for you to think about the character in different ways. Or you just enjoyed listening to my voice. All of which are perfectly fine. While I do love making brief looks, I also enjoy doing this too. Going back into a sitcom and finding a trans character and, well, thinking about how that trans character came across to us. If you do like that, then please consider liking, sharing, subscribing, commenting, giving me ideas for future videos and future sitcoms or future TV shows to dig into, or you can just tell me your own particular opinions in long-ass posts that I will try to read, but, like, my god, you've, you've written, like, 500 words, that's... that's a lot. If you really like what I do here, and actively want to see me make more videos, the easiest way to do that is by subscribing to my Patreon or funding me on Ko-Fi, as unfortunately, the world does demand that I pay for things like food, and rent, and electricity, all of which you might recognise as being essential to making sure that I can actually make these videos. It, I, it's upsetting. I wish that art was funded in a way where I could do this stuff and not have to be, like, also actively looking for study like work or looking for a full-time employment job or actively working full-time and doing other stuff that takes away from me to focus on research on recording on editing but that's just how it is and right now the best way that you can improve that is is, is through financial support i don't demand it but it would be nice God, having an existential financial crisis at the end of the video is actually it's kind of on par for I think this channel so you know anyway you might notice that at this point there are people scrolling past on the screen while I'm having this meltdown those people are already those who have subscribed to my patreon and are helping me and who words cannot possibly describe how much I appreciate what they're doing for me and that isn't a lead-in for me doing an interpretive dance to show it. That that I can promise that if you subscribe to my Patreon, I will never do an interpretive dance to let you know that I, I, I am thankful. So, you know, you got that to look forward to. You also get access to, like, videos posted earlier, and you also get to see sneak peeks of the brief looks that I make. So, you know, I try to do some stuff on there for people. Other than all of that... Thank you for watching this video, and I hope you have a great day.